So maybe it's time to start uh, our public lecture. It's really a great opportunity that we can offer here on Penn campus a public lecture on string theory and geometry given by Professor Kumrun Vafa. This conference is, uh, this lecture is actually part of a bigger conference, math, string math conference, which is the first one in a series of big meetings that will bring together mathematicians and physicists working on for, for forefront aspects of string theory. Uh, in particular, we are also trying to cap capitalize both in, during the conference and for this public lecture on strong activities here on Penn campus, both in math department, by physicists in the math physics group, as well as some connection to particle cosmology center here. This particular lecture is being funded by outreach funds of Department of Physics and Astronomy, and that's why I would like to ask our chair, Larry Gladney, to please introduce the speaker. Larry. for the conference. Um, I think uh, he's probably a man who needs very little introduction, but uh, let me go through a few of the things that are very relevant for his giving this particular talk. He's made many fundamental contributions to uh, string theory. Among others, he's done early work on compactification of string theory on overfolds. Um, he's worked on physics, mathematics, and so-called mirror symmetry, and he relates to the compactifications of string theory. He's worked on the correspondence quantitative uh, microscopic calculations of black entropy and has had important insights into the subject of duality between gravity and strongly interacting field theories, which is relevant for such fields as, uh, as uh, confinement. Professor Rafa is the now professor of science at Harvard University, fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a recipient of the American Mathematical Society, Leonard Eisenberg Prize for Mathematics and Physics, and a recipient of the Dirac Medal of the International Center for Theoretical Physics. This public lecture today on strings and geometry is going to cover some very exciting topics of uh, string theory, which is the framework, as many of you know, for the study of quantum gravity and the fundamental laws of nature. So without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to the Uh, thank you very much for the warm, warm introduction, and also thanks for inviting me to give this plenary, uh, this uh, public talk. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a tough topic to talk about, even though it's a lot of fun. Uh, there, I know that the audience involves very different uh, groups of people. Some I recognize as my expert colleagues, and some I'm assuming are g general undergraduates interested in science. So I have to say that I have geared this talk towards the latter group, so all the apologies to my colleagues if they expect otherwise. Uh, it's a very exciting topic. It's uh, something that is close to my heart, the connection between physics and geometry, and specifically strings and geometry. Um, and uh, I myself have always been interested in geometry. In fact, even before I was interested in physics, I was interested in geometry. So for me to see a, the fact that there is a deep connection between these two fields, uh, physics and geometry was a, uh, was a very happy coincidence for me as far as living in this era. It turns out we live in the exact right era for this connection. Well, maybe there was different eras. There were, there were similar connections. For example, the Greek geometers also came up with similar ideas. They had, they had thought about Euclidean geometry objects as being relevant perhaps to describing fire, earth, etc. And they had some beautiful mathematics. Uh, the physics of it was not that uh, well motivated, perhaps. <laughs> but they had beautiful mathematics, for sure. Now, we know that uh, geometry and physics really do connect nicely. Deep geometry and deep physics, it didn't connect that well back then. But we know that in the modern example of it, in the context of Einstein's theory, we already know that geometry does play a key role 
in describing the physics. So Einstein geometrized gravity, basically, to try to describe the, about the gravitational force in a geometric way. And my aim is to review the, some of these deep links which have appeared in the context of string theory between geometry and physics. But to do that, I have to take a step back to try to kind of recast the discussion in the context of a broader history of uh, modern physics. So I'm going to even step one step or two steps back to go to a, even a more basic step where things started for modern physics, which is with this guy. I assume everybody recognizes this fellow, but uh, this is where it fell, <laughs> uh, the famous apple. And uh, so he started describing the physics associated with uh, celestial objects starting with the falling of the apple and uh, talking about you know, various nice parabolic trajectories near the surface of the Earth and so forth and discussing uh, more general formulas for how the dynamics of objects work, how the force works, and uh, gave rise to a beautiful set of uh, equations and laws known as Newton's laws. So he ended up describing these beautiful facts about planetary orbits, uh, apple being one of them potentially, uh, of moons and so forth and satellites, which uh, found beautiful application in describing uh, planetary motion, uh, describing very nicely how things work with a very simple set of ideas, which in some sense uh, shows the power of mathematics uh, and uh, how it applies to real world. What is remarkable about what Newton did is that he had to inv invent a new mathematics to describe his laws or to really apply his laws to the, to the real world. So this is already an interesting example in terms of the interaction between physics and mathematics. The relevant math had to be invented for it to be applied. We know that his laws actually apply to a much wider scale, including even galactic motions and so forth. So it's a very amazing laws that even though they are very simple, they apply to very short scale, very small scale, and also very large scale in terms of a wide range of applicability, and that's one of the beautiful aspects of his theory. Uh, but uh, all of this is happening in flat space. Uh, we usually draw these Cartesian coordinates and so forth. Everything is happening with, with something which you can uh, view it as just some grids with the flat space being uh, placed there. Uh, but we know that was not the end of the story, and we know that uh, this fellow uh, came up with the fact that, first of all, this, the time has to be added into the ingredient. And uh, moreover, in addition to the time, the, the combination of space and time is not a flat object like the grid that Newton was uh, trying, to, uh, trying to explore. In particular, the space has a, has a um, curved geometry, and this curvature can change. So this, the dynamics of space became part of physics. This is clearly aspects of geometry and uh, putting objects, uh, masses and so forth can affect the local geometry and curvature of the space-time. So things will look, look like uh, placing objects in an in a elastic region and making the deformation of the space just like what would happen if you put an object on, on, a, on an elastic surface. And moreover, the objects move on this elastic surface just like uh, objects would move on a surface which is not flat, which is curved. So he tried, so Einstein came up with this geometric theory of gravitational force, which was very elegant and described these, the forces in terms of curvature. So this is kind of a caricature of what the basic ideas are. So if you think about the, the two ants uh, starting off parallel on a flat space, well, they end up going parallel forever and the distance between them doesn't change. And if you have a curved space, which is like a baseball, and if you start parallel, then you see that the ants get closer and closer. And if they, they, they start going parallel, but they notice that they're getting closer to each other as if there is a force attracting them. And similarly, on a negatively curved space, they, even though they start parallel, they kind of get repelled. So the idea that space curvature can play the role of a dynamical force is, shows that how it could potentially work in this language. So Einstein made, a, made fantastic use of the geometry and tried to basically use these ideas to try to replace the notion of a force as simply just a reaction of objects in going in geodesic uh, paths 
in a curved geometry. So matter curves the geometry and the particles and so forth go in paths which are geodesics. And for, as, we, as uh, was first demonstrated by the path that the, the rays of the uh, stars take near the sun, the orbits are, uh, are uh, of the, even the light is bending and the bending of the light was actually measured as one of the first confirmations of a sphere. Similarly, the planetary orbits can be explained geometrically as uh, the objects going in, uh, in, uh, in curved space. Now, I have to say that these are only caricatures, so please don't take this seriously too, too seriously, in the sense that the time is being, uh, is being ignored as one of the dimensions, and one of the main points of Einstein was the time being an important ingredient in the curvature. But uh, the, the nice thing about the, this geometric theory of Einstein, the Einstein's uh, general relativity, is the fact that it applies also to cosmological questions. So we can talk about issues having to do with early universe, the microwave background radiation, how that emerges and how that changes over time, how the galaxies form, and so on. So there's a very beautiful uh, story that has a wide range of applications and uh, even to date, it looks, uh, it's one of the more major active topics of research. So these, this is all nice and beautiful, uh, except that there's something comes and uh, fuzzy up the, 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 the landscape of discussion, and it has to do with particles. So just after Einstein introduced these, his theory, or around that time, people were discovering very amazing facts about particles, and particles were behaving in strange ways, and uh, Bohr came up with his theory about how the atom works, the orbit of the electrons were quantized, objects seemed to be playing in a different way, certain uncertainties arose, particles were not precisely at points, fuzziness at smaller scales seemed to dominate, and basically quantum theory was born. So quantum theory arose by trying to get particles into the discussion uh, in a way that was consistent with the observations of for example, uh, the spectrum of the hydrogen atom, and uh, very, very strange ideas was, were introduced in physics. Uh, the formalism emerging was very powerful and came up with very beautiful results explaining experimental data. The ideas of quantum mechanics were very revolutionary and uh, it was hard to swallow uh, these ideas. Bohr was one of the main proponents and uh, it was very radical, uh, even very intriguing for Einstein and the debates of Einstein and Bohr among the very interesting historical uh, dialogues among two physicists, which today people discuss. But uh, at any rate, the quantum mechanics was uh, believed to be the correct description of the theory, at least of the universe, at least the way we believe it up to now, it's still the correct description. And uh, one of the amazing thing about uh, the quantum theory is that it, it applies to all these different scales, we think, of, of the universe, including atomic scale, uh, where you have the electrons going around the orbit of the atoms or center of the nucleus, the nucleus itself being made up of uh, protons and neutrons, and the protons and neutrons being made of quarks, and uh, you might ask, what about next? What is quarks made of and so forth? And also, where is gravity in the story? We're talking about all these particles and so forth, but how does, how does gravity fit to this story? Nevertheless, it seems like quantum theory seems to be valid at all these different scales we have looked at, and so it's the correct principle. Now, the ideas of quantum theory have been checked by experiments uh, by experiments in the colliders. We have had huge amount of success in the past 50, 60 years in terms of the results that have been uh, predicted using the quantum theory. And it have, they have all been uh, fantastically verified to a great degree of accuracy. Now, um, what, what that means is, uh, well, these are looking like a very crazy set of paths, but somehow these ideas can be understood thanks to work by many physicists and in particular Feynman in trying to understand uh, how to think about these quantum theories of not just single particles but collection of these particles or more precisely quantum fields. 
So you have these fields of uh, fields like electric and magnetic fields, and you try to make them quantum objects and, and fuzzy. And once you try to describe them in a fuzzy way, interacting with matter, you end up with very interesting uh, framework known as quantum field theory, uh, which was one of the, I think, major uh, achievements of physicists in the past century in trying to understand how it works. So the basic idea would be that we think about the particles as exchanging uh, particles among each other. So for example, we can think about this blue ball as kind of an electron, and this uh, yellow line as kind of a photon being exchanged between the electrons. And we think about the particles exerting force on one another by exchange of particles in this way. Uh, this being the very simplest kind of an exchange, well, where just one particle exchanges one particle to the other one, the other one grabs it and goes its way. Uh, but you can have more complicated exchanges, like uh, multi-particles exchanging, coming and exchanging particles. And this is the word line of particles. In this case, the showing electrons and positrons coming in and annihilating and going back to electron and positrons again via photons. So you can have various paths or you can have electrons emitting photons, absorbed by electrons, and electrons doing something crazy and so forth. You can have many different kinds of diagrams. And all of these have been verified in terms of uh, precision tests in, uh, in various collider physics experiments. And so we are very happy with our status of understanding of how these quantum fields work. Which brings me to the next story. So quantum mechanics seems very beautiful and powerful and consistent and nice. And gravity, uh, Einstein's theory, seems to be very powerful but classical. And when you try to put them together, uh, combine quantum theory with gravity, uh, unfortunately things don't work that well. Um, well, disaster happens here, as you can see. <laughs> it is. Uh, it is uh, difficult to make sense of, and the difficulty in making sense of is displayed here by this yellow bright spot here. But that basically mathematically means that when you try to do computation, you get infinities. And infinities don't make sense. When you're trying to compute the, what's the probability of this or that happening, you find the answers are infinite, which don't, don't make any sense. So, so somehow, if you try to understand quantum gravity in the context of particle physics, Viewing the gravitational force itself as being mediated by gravitational particles, which we, call, call, which we could call gravitons, you find the theory just does not make sense. So this is, uh, has been one of the major uh, stumbling blocks in trying to advance the notion of quantum field theories to, to the whole physics, because gravity just doesn't want to play with that game. So what do we do? Well, the physicists had two different attitudes about this. Feynman himself says, I don't care too much about this fact. It don't work. Gravity is, uh, as a quantum theory, may be true or not, but pr should be presumably true, but it's not relevant because we cannot do any experiments on it in our labs today. So we'll ignore the problem. Now, this is not exactly what he said, but it's close to what his attitude was. And it's an it's attitude which is shared by many physicists that, in some sense, experiments should drive the physics. And so if you cannot do experiments today to check what, the, what gravity should look like in, an, in a lab, then I'm not even interested in the question. Now, that could be an attitude that you could say uh, could be uh, a pragmatic attitude for scientists that we can wait and see when the question comes in the lab. Then I will go and see what lab, has, what lab results have come out. And then I'll come up with a theory trying to explain it. Now, on the other hand, Historically, uh, theorists are more ambitious in some sense that we try to predict what has to happen even in the labs that have not been constructed yet. Well, that's the task of theory, prediction. But this takes prediction in a different sense. It's not a prediction of something that you can check in the lab tomorrow because the experiments that would need to check the quantum effects of gravity turn out to require energies so huge that we cannot uh, possibly created in our labs tomorrow. But the idea would be if anybody could create sufficient conditions to test the idea, what would they see? Now, this kind of theoretical kind of question is appealing to many theorists, but it's not appealing to other groups. So a bunch of physicists who are interested in these theoretical questions about what if we could construct this and that lab, what would we see in experiments, drove a lot of 
theorists to try to answer this question. Not a lot of them, I should add. A bunch of them, perhaps. Now, uh, that did not yield too much answer, actually. Instead, what happened was a group of uh, physicists who were trying to understand how strong interactions work in the laboratories came up gradually with some theory which involved, at the end, they found strings. They found instead of particles, they're talking about strings when they were trying to describe how strong interactions work. Not interested in necessarily gravity, but simply trying to understand how strong interactions work. And uh, later, they found out that the theory of, that they came up with, namely the strings, had nothing to do per se with strong interactions. But indeed, it had a particle among its spectrum, which corresponded to graviton, the gravitational particle, which could mediate the gravitational force. So those group of physicists who were interested in this object suddenly said, OK, we're not describing the strong interaction. We are describing quantum gravity. So quantum gravity, in the context of string theory, was born by pure accident. The attempt was not really to try to quantize gravity, but ended up doing so nevertheless. So this was already uh, in late 60s and early 70s where this kind of uh, approach was taking hold. And out of pure coincidence, this theory was born. It per se had nothing to do with geometry. It had nothing to do with string theory either to begin with. It originally was written as a certain formula describing certain scattering of particles, which it had so many excitations in it, which people tried to put it in a consistent framework, they found these excitations look very much like excitations that you see on a string. So then they came up with a string as a description of the theory they had come up with accidentally. Very bizarre construction. But now we take it completely the other way and we just say, OK, let's forget about how it came about. We don't need to know those details. We just study strings because we're interested in quantum gravity. So we're changing the order of history of how it happened. The string comes to the rescue of solving quantum gravity, which means basically the idea is that the particles and everything we have, like quarks and so forth, are replaced by one-dimensional objects, which are strings. What it means is that if you take this point particle like quarks, and you imagine zooming in with an ever more powerful microscope at a scale that's very, very tiny, much, much tinier than nuclear scale, then you would find, indeed, it's not a point, but perhaps a one-dimensional object like a string. Now, so this is a picture. You can replace these quarks by these one-dimensional objects like strings. And that would be a potential description of the full theory, which will have a quantum theory of gravity in a consistent framework, avoiding the infinities of the usual particle description of gravity. And the, strong, the string interactions are like, somewhat like particles. You know, the strings come along. They exchange strings to each other. The strings come, and the string splits to another string, and another string absorbs it. Uh, this is similar to the diagram I was describing for you in terms of a particle, like the electron, coming and throwing an, a photon to the other electron and absorbing it. But the nice thing about this is that uh, the string interactions is smooth, that is, if you think about two strings coming and joining together, the, the, the time history of this interaction gives you a smooth geometry of a pair of pants, which is a nice smooth geometry. This is unlike the case of the particle, where a particle comes and splits on the particle. You get a point where which one particle has bifurcated two particles. And so you have a singular point there where something special happens. Here, Something special does not happen in any particular place. You could say it's happening right there, but that depends on how I'm drawing my slicing of this pan. There's a pan. If I draw it by different angles, I'll get this point being different places. So it's kind of smooths out where the interaction is happening. And it turns out that this smoothing out of the interaction is the reason why the infinities of quantum gravity disappear in the context of string theory, whereas they are there in the context of particle description. So strings, by the fact that they are extended objects, allows you to kind of smooth out the interaction point of this object, and by that trick, gets rid of the infinities. So this is a, uh, this is a picture of how it would look like. You have these two strings coming together and interacting and coming up to one string as, as you go over time. Joining of the strings, of course, you can reverse it. 
and go downwards with one string splitting to two strings. The amazing thing is that all the interactions that we have in the context of uh, particle physics or gravity, in principle, can be done with one diagram, basically this diagram. And so the question is, how could this possibly describe all the interactions we know of, electromagnetic interactions, weak and strong interaction, gravitational interactions? How could it be this simple? Well, the idea is that the string itself has many, many different degrees of freedom corresponding to how the string is vibrating or how the string is moving around in space and which kind of thing it wraps around and so forth. Depending on what configuration of string you start with, you get different particles. And yes, indeed, once you have that state in the string, this gives you the interaction of the, the string with any other state of the string to give you a third state of the string. It's that simple. So not only the, the description of the geometry smooth, it's very powerful and without any further rule, it kind of describes the interactions. So it's very geometric, but also very powerful. This was an experiment done at Harvard a few weeks ago. I just, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this is what, <laughs> this is a picture we would like to see somewhere, but anyhow. So this is the idea, you have two strings coming and going to the third string. Or, and then splitting again to two strings. You can think about this as a scattering of strings. Or you can have more interesting geometries like a string coming, splitting to two strings and then recombining. This is geometrically a nice, uh, well, it looks like a torus with two holes in it. So you have this donut shaped object with two holes on it. And you know, so the, the string theory is becoming to look uh, to, to make contact with the theory of Riemann surfaces, which is well developed in the 19th century by mathematicians, and beautiful math has been associated to them ever since. And so those same objects appeared in studying string interactions. So a beautiful math ended up being used in the context of studying particle scatterings and so forth in the context of string theory. You can have more fancy diagrams. This is another one, two particles coming and going through this donut and two particle coming out, you can imagine a more general picture which will look like a fancy pretzel of various kinds with many, many holes and particles coming and going. And this gives you the geometry of the strings coming and interacting and splitting and joining, all captured by this beautiful picture. It's just the picture is nice. And it, it is somehow uh, more economical than particle description, where in the particle description, you had all these Feynman diagrams which is complicated and different and you have to do many, many diagrams to describe an interactions to a given order, whereas here, just the number of holes captures the order of the interaction. It's simpler. So the, conceptually, it's simpler. Mathematically, it's more beautiful. Of course, technically, it's much harder to compute. But there's an elegance in, in, the, in the setup. So already, we see a piece of geometry appearing, the geometry of these Riemann surfaces. And so this is the beginning of the link between strings and geometry. That is, we are seeing already an important ingredient of geometry, namely the smoothness of a Riemann surface, coming and rescuing the infinity of quantum gravity amplitudes. The fact that Riemann surface is nice is the reason we are avoiding the infinities. So roughly this is the same picture I was telling you about, that the objects are made of atoms, like solids made of atoms and so forth. And Ultimately, we have these nuclei made of quarks and quarks made of strings and different excitations, but now even gravity is one of these objects. So everything looks very, very simple in some sense. But these are very, you should bear in mind that these strings are supposedly very, very tiny. They could be uh, typically very, very small, as small as 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. We hope they are not that small, but they could be. And uh, so, so these pictures uh, you should take with a grain of salt. You cannot take your ordinary microscope and find these pictures. So they seem to be this nice string and so forth seems to explain all these interactions in a nice simple way. Um, so everything looks fine. At least in principle, we can have all the interactions described. However, um, there is a caveat, there's a big caveat Strings connections between geometry and physics seems to start with the, on the wrong foot. Uh, there's a minor, minor embarrassment in the story, which up to now I have tried to hide, but now I, I will face it. 
String theory demands that space time not be four dimensional, as Einstein would have liked, three plus one, at least originally, but actually 10 or maybe 11. That sounds bizarre. Now, it's not like because we have 10 fingers or somebody has 11 or whatever. <laughs> it, is, it is that it wasn't working if it wasn't 10. You write the theory down, so I don't want 10, I want four. Sorry, it doesn't work. Okay, five, no, it doesn't work. Nine, no, the, 10, okay, great, works. The theory is not consistent otherwise. It's very, very uh, particular. It chooses the dimension of space-time. That's very, very particular for any physical theory. We are not familiar with that kind of thing where the physics itself dictates a dimension. But here it is. String theory says dimension is 10. Great. Well, not exactly great because uh, how do we get our answers in 4D physics? We see three-dimensional space and one time. And where is the rest of the six dimensions we're talking about in the context of string theory? String theory predicts that there are at least six more spatial dimensions. So three of them we see, what are the extra six? Well, the first attempt at the answer is kind of is to hide it away. We say, we think about these extra six dimensions as curled up spheres, tiny, tiny little spheres. If you ask how many angels live there, you can ask them, but not, not relevant. We're interested in the leftover space, which is three dimensional. So in other words, you think about each point in space having these tiny spheres. And every time you do an experiment, they are so tiny you won't see them. You'll do an average experiment that averages over all these, these degrees of freedom because they are so tiny. Therefore, you would never know about them. So you should be happy. You should be relaxed. The space is three-dimensional. OK. Well, uh, <clears throat> OK, we have avoided the potential direct clash with experiments by hiding away six dimensions. But that's not satisfactory. Uh, the reason it's not satisfactory is that whenever you get something new in physics, they should be good for something new, not something to hide. So w the question that has to be answered is, what are the extra dimensions good for? If it were just there to hide away, that would not be satisfactory. So we really have to have a good use for these extra dimensions to answer physical questions. And it turns out that precisely these extra dimensions is where the fun starts. It is because of these extra dimensions that the interaction between physics and geometry takes place. So these extra six dimensions is not the source of embarrassment, it turns out, for string theory, but source of great joy, as I'll try to explain uh, in the rest of my talk. Well, before I get to that, I would like to draw, I would like to put this uh, painting, the drawing, I mean, uh, by Escher, whose uh, who's drawing here symbolizes something which I find beautiful in many ways, but in particular, a feature of this drawing is what I think is very inspiring to string theorists, I would think, which uh, basically the seamless flow of objects from one side of the drawing, up or down, left or right, uh, as each corner has its own story to say. Something else is happening in each corner, but when you gradually go from one corner to the other, nothing dramatic happens in any place, but gradually changes the picture. Now, it turns out that a similar story was discovered in the context of string theory about 15 years ago or so, which is known as dualities. We found that strings which in some corner of the parameters look in a particular way, if you change the parameters of the theory, they behave very differently. You go left, right, up, down, that same string behaves something different. And this duality opened up the whole new notion about what string theory is. We had thought string theory is a theory about one-dimensional objects, but we learned that's not true. It could be a one-dimensional object in one little corner of the landscape, but if you move around, it could be a very different object, and the theory looks completely different. So the theory became far more richer geometrically and much, much more interesting. And in particular, we discovered that string theory has extended objects, which we call brains, here denoted by this yellow sheet here, where, in fact, they can even uh, cut the strings open. So if the strings go and touch these brains, they can cut them. So it's like, be, watch out, you can cut open. So that's what happens to strings which come close to these brains, they can cut open. And it turns out that that's actually a very nice welcome feature. So the strings can cut open. And it's, in fact, not only they can cut open, the strings can themselves become brains themselves if you change these parameters. So it's like, uh, you know, you see these pictures of these objects morphing to each other. Well, this could happen with objects in string theory. 
strings can become brains, strings can end on brains like these, can be cut by brains. So it's a beautiful geometry turns suddenly open in terms of lots of possibilities that affect the physics. For example, we think about the uh, potential description of the forces and so forth in terms of the strong forces given by SU3 gauge group and SU2 and so forth, the technical point is not relevant, being just described by these brains, a stack of them, you put two of them, three of them, one of them, and so on, and these strings which are connecting different sheets to each other, playing the role of particles. So the, sh the, the objects which go from, uh, let's say, this sheet to this sheet will be quarks of one type, and this sheet to that sheet is leptons of one kind. So you begin to describe these particles in a geometric way. You can even describe forces uh, or particles which mediate forces in terms of geometry. So this six-dimensional six space could have spheres in them. For example, if you zoom into a piece of this space, you might find five spheres in them attached in a funny way. If you find spheres like this attached in a funny way, and you take one of your, these extended objects which I call brains, and wrap around one of these spheres, you get a particle in four dimensions. And if you wrap it around a different one, you get a different particle whose charge is different, or different, or different, or different. Or in fact, you can have two of them wrapped and connected together. So you get different objects with different charges and different properties depending on how the brain wraps around these geometries. So the internal geometry of the, of the strings, these extra six dimensions which we were trying to hide away, come to center stage and play an important role in dictating what aspects of physics we are going to get. In addition, these brains, which are these objects which strings can change into, can play the role of new particles by when you wrap around these spheres. In fact, more interesting things can happen. For example, uh, if you think about the strings, the, the picture I had before, this one, you can, you can change the geometry of this, uh, this theory by changing the parameters. And when you change the parameters, the sphere that I was drawing becomes just this thin line. And the, the brain that I was wrapping around, you can view it as some object stretched between these two ends of this line. So the description of particles can change, and the geometry can change as you change the parameters in your theory, as, as in, uh, remind you in this Escher picture, Escher drawing, that could happen. But moreover, it turns out that the sizes of the geometry play the role of parameters of the physical theory in four dimensions. For example, this length turns out to be inversely related to the strength of the interaction of particles that these red things represent. So this being related to the inverse scale of the part, inverse strength of the interactions, it implies that if this length shrinks, the interaction becomes stronger and stronger. Now it turns out that if you put these particles wrapped around these geometries, and if you go towards longer and longer distances, it turns out that it effectively shrinks uh, this geometry, therefore making the interaction stronger and stronger and stronger. So in particular, if you, if you take this and shrink it like this, you get at the point where there's no distance left over, and therefore the interaction is infinite because it was related to the inverse of the distance between them. So you have, you have hit the point where the interaction is infinitely strong. Now, this is the kind of question in quantum field theory we want to know the answer to. What happens if the interactions are infinitely strong or become very strong? This is a hard question for quantum field theory which is difficult to answer, but string theory can come up with a geometrical resolution of it. In fact, we might think that uh, the most naive thing is to continue when they came together, well, just to continue the path that they were marching towards. But that doesn't look good, does it? I mean, the geometry doesn't look good if, if I just push them to negative interaction, negative infinite interaction strength. That doesn't make sense. It turns out that Mathematicians have studied these kind of situations where the geometry becomes singular, and what happens after you pass through the singularity, which is what they call the resolution of the singularities. And in this case, what happens is that instead of the silly geometry turning on like this, you end up getting a, a, a new geometry and a new, new sphere opens up. 
So things happen in a smooth way and gives you an answer to a question in the context of the quantum field theory, which was very hard to do, which was the interaction becoming infinitely strong. Somehow the jump is saying, oh, don't worry, the answer is simple. It's not as hard as you thought. A new geometry opens up. So then geometry and the geometric transitions, a mathematical ingredient, comes to, to aid physicists in terms of proposing an answer to a tough question of quantum field theories. And in fact, you can, this thing can also be done in a smooth way, where if you again change the parameter, again, remember the Escher drawing, you get a new picture, this picture takes place, and the things look perfectly smooth. You think shrinks, and the new geometry opens up. It's a perfectly seamless situation, and things go very nicely and smoothly. So this gives you an added viewpoint about how the strong dynamics work in the context of string theory. So this is one, this is a, one use of these extra uh, use of the extra dimensions in string theory, but that's not all. Another example of black hole entropy. So what, what is black hole? Well, we know black hole is what happens when you have a lot of mass concentrated in a small region in space. And uh, already it was proposed by Bekenstein and Hawking in the 70s that the, the number of degrees of freedom of a black hole, the entropy of a black hole, S, is proportional to the one quarter of the area of the horizon of the black hole. The horizon of the black hole, as you know, is the region beyond which even not, even not even the lights can escape. So if you are inside the horizon of a black hole, everything is contained there, and uh, you have to be outside the horizon for the light to escape. But it turns out that the prediction is that the entropy of the black hole is one quarter of the area. On the other hand, if you compute the degrees of freedom of the black hole, you find that there's a unique solution to the black hole equations. So there's exactly one state. Entropy is zero. So the classical prediction of, of, of Einstein's theory is entropy is zero. Whereas Bekenstein and Hawking, studying quantum corrections to that formula, came up with this formula one quarter of the area. And the question was, what are these degrees of freedom? Because naively, Einstein's theory suggests there's only one state. Whereas we, we must have a huge number of states if it's given by a big area of a horizon. That's a huge area. That means there's a huge entropy. That means the black hole must have a huge number of microstates accounting for such a huge entropy. What is going to account for it? So this was one of the puzzles that Bekenstein and Hawking were led to. They found the formula, but they, they didn't find an explanation of where these degrees of freedom of black hole are hidden. Well. In the context of string theory, we can model a black hole by thinking of it in terms of a brain, for example, this one dimensional object in this case, or maybe higher dimensional cycles, wrapping around cycles of this internal six dimensional manifold, six dimensional space, which I remind you was our embarrassment. So this embarrassment for us is now a place where something can wrap around and occupy a particular point in space. So think about this blue plane here as our three-dimensional space. And think about this red space as our six-dimensional extra space. And these are our brains wrapping around some cycles on this internal six-dimensional space, which correspond to a given point in space. Now, if you just have wrapping around this like, like one cycle of it and occupying one given point, it doesn't look like it's a very massive black hole. But you can try to make it massive by putting more and more wrapping. As it gets more and more wrapped, you get more and more, um, you get more, and more uh, curvature and creating a horizon near the point that you're wrapping, creating a black hole. And so you have a geometry like this, where you form a black hole by more and more of a wrapping of this brain around the internal cycles of this six-dimensional space. The more complicated you make your wrapping, the more degrees of freedom you have. In fact, if you have a lot, of, if I give you a lot of strings and I say, okay, you can use this much of material, go and do whatever you want in the six-dimensional space, you can go crazy with all these possible paths you find. The bigger the material I give you, which is the bigger the mass of the black hole is, the more options you have in going around the various loops. But that's precisely the entropy of the black hole. The entropy of the black hole is precisely the internal degrees of freedom of these objects wrapping the internal cycles of the six-dimensional space. So the question of count, accounting for the internal entropy of the black hole simply boils down to finding the how many ways 
you can wrap around the internal cycles of the six dimensional space by the brain you're given with. So you can then sit down and say, okay, I will sit down and do my computation of how many ways I can wrap these brains around the eternal geometry of the six dimensional space. This is where again the physics and, ma and math have a strong interaction. How many nice ways are there of wrapping objects around the internal space is a very nice area of mathematics, enumerative geometries being part of it. And so there's a huge amount of interest in the math in trying to understand these objects in its own right, forget about the physics. Now they nicely turn out to correspond to questions of accounting for the degrees of freedom of the black hole, the microstates of black hole for us. So the question, that geometric question turns out to have this beautiful physics answer accounting for the missing in entropy that Bekenstein and Hawking were looking for. We sit down, we do the computations, we count how many degrees of freedom we get. Lo and behold, we get the answer that Bekenstein and Hawking were predicting simply by accounting for the degrees of freedom of these wrappings. Again, showing that the extra dimensions are not for embarrassing us, but actually they are where the degrees of freedom of the four dimensional physics is hiding. So we're now putting to use these extra dimensions to answer questions which were left open in the context of four dimensional physics. There are other questions that could be understood in a similar vein. Uh, another question is, I just want to draw a, a, another example, involves the kind of questions that were posed by Wheeler in the context of trying to uh, combine quantum mechanics with gravity. In that context, uh, Wheeler noticed that if you combine quantum theory gravity, just a very simple back of the envelope type of calculation would suggest that the space is extremely complicated looking at the distance scale of 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. This is where the gravitational interactions will become strong and so strong that it will tear the space in a very, very uh, non-smooth way. And so, in fact, what one expects is that at spaces that if I go to that distance scale, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, uh, the space is fluctuating in size and this scale is also known as Planck scale. So even the topology of space will fluctuate locally. You have these space having these handles forming and going from one to the other. So you can think about this as a good model of the space as some kind of a bubbling of this geometry at such a small distance scale. And the scales that we usually talk about, the macroscopic scale is kind of a long distance scale, which we average over all these fluctuations. And so if string theory is a quantum theory of, um, if string theory is a good quantum theory of gravity, it should also account for such fluctuations. Now, this in principle is not so easy to see in the string theory because it involves a lot of difficult questions that we have still to develop techniques for answering. However, it turns out that there is a baby version of this question which does arise in the context of what we call topological strings. So the, in the context of a baby version of string theory which lives in these extra six dimensions, the same kind of questions arise. And in particular, trying to understand these kind of geometries of how these bubblings happen in the space, in these six dimensional geometries, and how these quantum forms, which I'm just drawing here characteristically, gets related to a funny story of a crystal meltings. So the geometry turns out of the corners of the crystal turns out to be related to the, to the way the strings perceives the geometries of a complex three-dimensional space. So here you have the three-dimensional directions, one, two, and three directions for the crystal. It turns out that this three-dimensional geometry is very much similar to the three-dimensional complex geometry that the string perceives, which is six real dimensions. And these, these kind of uh, rounding of this crystal melting turns out to be mapped to this notion of these fluctuations of the quantum geometry. In particular, the, if you think about microscopic crystal geometry, sorry, macroscopic crystal geometry as a string geometry, the way the string sees, you could ask what is the atomic structure of the crystal? And the atomic structure of the crystal is going to be our quantum form. The quantum gravitational form is somewhat like these atoms in analogy to the atoms of this crystal playing the same role. So if you take a simple model for the melting crystal, thinking about these points of the, uh, of, the, of the cube as where the atoms are, 
Here uh, you see the corner of the crystal is removed. You can think about this as melting of the crystal. It starts from the corner and eats inside. Uh, of course, you can think about it either as, uh, as uh, removing atoms from the corners, or alternatively, you can think of them as piling up cubes on the corner of the room, whichever way you wish. I hope it doesn't give you a headache. <laughs> but anyhow, so. so anyhow, so we can try to count how many ways you can put cubes into the corner of a room. That sounds like a fun game. We can try to count that. It turns out that that piling up of the cubes in the corner of the room, that silly game, turns out to be the same non-silly game of these quantum fluctuations of the space, where each one of these points you're putting there turns out mathematically to correspond to blowing up a point of a space and replacing it by some other object. So this, this putting of the atom or removing of the atoms is a pseudonym or a code for replacing a point by a blow. -up. So a mathematical operation you can understand mathematically, simply described by this piling up of this cube. So this game here turns out to have an actually amazing application in understanding a non-trivial complicated geometry at least for this baby version of string theory, which we see in the context of topological strings. So it's quite amazing that this simple game can, can lead us to such insights. So far away, you see these non, uh, if you are far away from the points of the atom, you see a nice smooth kind of crystals. But of course, if you zoom in, you see these atomic structure of this crystal, somewhat similar to this quantum form that you expect to happen at the short distance scales in the context of string theory. But of course, stepping back, you, you don't see them, and you just see the nice, smooth geometry. So this, these are all illustrations of the kind of things that emerge in the context of string theory. Deep mathematics, all of these end up having deep connections with mathematics, which is interesting to mathematicians, not because they are appearing for string theory, but they're interesting, and they're studying it independently of physicists. So they're kind of two different kind of reasons to study it, one purely mathematically, and the other one for purely understanding string theory. And the fact that they converge is a happy coincidence, or perhaps not accidental. It's a, it's a happy coincidence for us. We have uh, two different communities with very different tool sets, which apply to the same problem with very different motivations and very different uh, ideas. And actually, a lot of progress has happened precisely because of the fact that we have these two different kind of viewpoints and two different communities working on similar problems. Now, usually, there's a, uh, whenever uh, there's deep mathematics underlying uh, the physical theory, it's usually a good sign. Like calculus, for example, was a deep thing, which, under, uh, which was an underlying aspect of Newton's uh, application to, of Newton's laws, as we know. Of course, it doesn't always have to be this way. As we know, for example, special theory of relativity involves the boring linear algebra mathematically, but as beautiful physics, so it's not necessary that all beautiful physics have to have very complicated math. But general relativity of Einstein did have complicated math and deep, deep complicated physics. At any rate, we don't know whether we should see this as evidence for the validity of string theory or not. Certainly, it's, it's something we welcome. We have fun with it. It's a beautiful part of uh, physics and geometry, and it has led to a lot of interesting progress in mathematics and in physics, even if you're not necessarily interested in string theory. If you're, for example, just interested in quantum field theory, a lot of aspects of quantum field theory, for example, the strong coupling phenomenon I was mentioning, has found answers which are somehow captured by geometrical features or mathematical features of string theory. It's fair to say that uh, we are witnessing an ongoing re revolution linking geometry and physics. Uh, Different people have different takes on it. I mean, some people emphasize the geometry more. Some people emphasize completely new physics that's emerging. All of these are happening, and it's, it's a multifaceted object. And there are huge amount of different angles you can take on it. But it's, I think, hard to deny something deep is taking place. All these different communities interested in the sing single type of problems. We find applications of string theory to diverse areas as diverse as condensed matter physics high energy collisions involving heavy ions and so forth, we have a lot of different kinds of interests which, uh, which uh, come together in the context of string theory. And of course, deep mathematics is, is an added uh, bonus. We have learned a lot in the past 
20, 30 years, but a lot remains to be learned. And I think it's still uh, very much a work in progress. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. Well, the deep answer to that question, I would say we still don't have it. We just know how to compute it in the context of string theory. There's more insight in the context of a principle which we call holography, which basically suggests that uh, degrees of freedom of gravity can be accounted for by one lower dimensions in general. So there's, there's a hidden description involving holography which kind of tries to explain that. Oh, why? Um, well, the 10 is related to, let's see, how would I say it? Um, well, string has one dimension. String, uh, worksheet has two dimensions. One plus one, one string and one time moving around. So worksheet is two dimension. 10 minus two is eight. Okay, so that's, that's eight. So now I have to explain why eight is important. <laughs> now, eight is important because, um, eight is important for many mathematical reasons. Because it turns out that uh, in eight dimension, if I draw a vector, and if I draw a, what we call a spinner, they're interchangeable with each other in a funny way. And that only happens in eight dimensions. And that is related to why what the beautiful symmetry which we have in string theory called supersymmetry, and some beautiful facts which arise from that. So, so the underlying reason has to do with, the, with this symmetry, the supersymmetry, which is very special to eight. And 8 plus 2 is 10, and that's the 10. Now, 11 is a 10% error in that completion. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, the, to, be, to, to, be, to make the list bit more interesting, 10 has to do with the fact that 2, the worksheet being 1 plus 1, is actually 2 plus 1. Because it's actually what we call membrane, which if you wrap around the circle, becomes looks like a string. So it's 1 plus 1 or 2 plus 1. So it's 3 plus 8 or 2 plus 8. 8 is 8. <laughs> Yes. I wouldn't say necessarily field theory. Something classical takes place. Now, it will involve effective theories which look like gravity and Einstein's theory and so forth. So we do get things like uh, electrodynamics. We do get Einstein's theory and all that as a classical limit of string theory, just like what you would expect. We don't necessarily call it field theory. People try to describe what they call string field theory. And some aspects work, some aspects don't work that greatly. So I wouldn't necessarily call it the field theory. But certainly, it's still true, as you say, that as h bar goes to 0, you get the notions which are classical, just like what you expect. Excellent question. Excellent question. I was hoping someone would ask that question. Uh, there is, there's no telling when. I would just say when, not if. <laughs> there's no telling when this happens. Uh, I think that uh, there are various possibilities, I would say. Um, as far as modeling, there, there are people who are trying to model, for example, condensed matter using string ideas. Those are modeling aspects. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, there might be some direct you know, applications in that context. And, you might set up some condensed matter system with applications. But if you ask the direct aim of string theory, which is quantum gravity, and that if you're asking when would that potentially be potentially checked, I would say that there are two natural 
possibilities there. One is in the extreme small and the other one is extreme large. Extreme large being cosmology and extreme small being the particle physics. And in both fronts, the interesting experiments are being taking place right now. So uh, the LHC, as you know, is taking data and so forth. String theory, uh, string theory's natural scale is still far, far smaller than LHC. So we have to be lucky to have some say on that. Uh, nevertheless, in string theory, people have tried to make predictions, even for the scales as low as LHC energy scale, compared to the string scale. And so we have some predictions there for some models. It is not, it is not a, uh, it is not a forced uh, prediction of string theory. In other words, you have to make assumptions to get a specific prediction. But there are nevertheless some natural assumptions which lead to some well-motivated uh, predictions. So that's one possibility. Who knows? Now, if supersymmetry is not found in LHC, which is unfortunately a, not an unlikely possibility, then it's going to be harder because a lot of these discussions in the context of string theory use supersymmetry to, uh, to try to make predictions. And without supersymmetry, the dynamics of string theory is very complicated. So that's one area. So we have to be lucky in there. But who knows? Maybe we are. Another area is cosmology, of course. And uh, people trying to use string theory to build models to try to describe how the universe works at the very early universe. It could be models of universe involving uh, new kinds of uh, cosmologies involving strings. Or it could be uh, all type of models on, on uh, cosmology like inflations, where people try to have whether we can have a more predictive framework for how the inflation takes place, what are the exact parameters there, and so forth. So there could be a variety of possibilities. And on the other hand, there could be also these macroscopic objects like black holes, like spinning black holes. Maybe some properties of these spinning black holes are very specific to string theory. And maybe we can see something. Who knows? So it's really not completely clear which one, if, uh, if any of them, will first happen. But hopefully one of them will happen. And I think uh, we'll have to just wait. Hopefully we'll, we live long enough to see it. This one thing, symmetry breaking string theory is similar to what happens in uh, the usual field theories. So uh, for example, one, uh, the, the notion of, for example, Higgs mechanism, where, where you use to, to, for example, break this electroweak symmetries, uh, can be described geometrically in string theory. For example, you have some degrees of freedom and this internal six dimensional geometry. And if they choose a different value, then you Higgs the theory. So, Changing the parameters of what dictates to you what's happening in the sixth dimension is the same parameters that describe the Higgs field or other fields that describe how the symmetry can be broken. And the dynamics may prefer, just like the usual dynamics might prefer uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, the same kind of thing could take place in string theory. So that's not that different in the context of string theory. Thank you.